got that power Good morning, good morning, good morning. You are now tuned in to the E-Life Power Lunch Show. I am Chris Murray, and I'm here with the one and only Dr. Baruch. How are you? I am doing great, Chris. How about yourself? I am wonderful. It's a sunny day outside, so that's always good. Is it? Uh, yeah, it's it still 30-something degrees. It is, but, you know, on the inside, we have the heat blasting, so, you know, you kind of forget <laughs> about it a little bit. <laughs> yes, 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 indeed, indeed. So what else is going on in the world? What do uh, you got? Uh, we have, um, let's see, let's see what I have. Okay, if you today. don't have something, I got something. That works. I, I think we, we need to start discussing, you know, some, some issues that are impacting our community. And I, I happen to have been reading, not that we don't. I mean, let me not say it like we right, never do. Right, right. <laughs> but we're looking at uh, this school to prison pipeline that is becoming more of an issue in our community, especially now with certain states. Now, I'm going to read you some of this. I probably should get you to read it. But um, it says here, in a move that will likely doom countless children to the school to prison pipeline, certain states will soon charge students who get into fights with felonies. Mm. A state statute that goes into effect on January 1, 2017 will no longer treat fights in schools or buses as a minor offense regardless of a young person's age or grade. Instead, school resources uh, officers and local law enforcement will now intervene by arresting and charging them with an assault in the third degree, a Class E felony. That type of assault can result in four years of prison time, fines, or probation. Attempts or threats to cause harm will be treated as a Class A misdemeanor, which can lead to a year of prison time. If law enforcement or school officials consider the assaulted person a special victim, a student can be charged with a Class D felony that comes with a maximum prison term of seven years. Wow. Goodness gracious. That's a lot. Like, really? This, no matter what age. Right. I was going to say, these are our babies. You could be five years old. You hit somebody upside the head with your lunchbox. Up. Oh, that's, that's, wow. and, if, and if the person that you hit upside the head with a lunchbox happens to have special needs, you right. shouldn't have been doing it. Yes. Uh, I admit. Don't hit the child with the lunchbox. Don't hit the child at all. Right. But now you hit them. Now you're in jail for seven years. You're not going to see daylight until 12. Well, what's the motivation behind this? I, I, I mean, I'm sure there are studies that show the effects of being in jail for long terms. I'm sure there are studies that show the effects of being in jail at a young age. And my guess would be that neither one of those studies produce information that's positive um, in how it affects those individuals. So what does this really help? <laughs> well, it depends on your perspective, Chris. Because, see, your perspective is that of a parent yeah. with children and concerned about your children. There's another perspective, and that is these little kids can work for our big corporations and make us money, and we can get them off the street, and we can begin to train them to be lifelong criminals because that's what the penal, the penal institutions are doing now. They're, they're training and conditioning people to be lifelong criminals. And uh, so now you get an opportunity to get them at an early age and condition them sufficiently so that you know you're going to have them for the rest of their lives. So this goes back to that 13th Amendment. Oh, yeah. Definitely. But it's like in full effect. This is crazy. Yeah, this is, this is a lot. And I just, you know, I hadn't heard anything about this, and I'm glad that you shared it with me today so that I can, you know, do my research and just really figure out what's going on. I just, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I've seen some stuff from the other end on the positive side where there are maybe some schools that are trying to implement yoga and other things just to try to get the kids to um, find alternatives to whatever issues they may be going, um, may be going on. And I think, you know, a lot of it, it stems from what's going on at home, you know, maybe what's going on in the school, what's going on in the community. So like you said, my perspective is always going to be from a parent because that's, you know, my number one thing that I think about. And so I think, I, I don't know, I, I feel like what I think doesn't even matter because it's, this is something that's happening. <laughs> one, one of the lines that they said in this is that students of color will now have an even larger target on their back. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if we're not already, you know, under siege, now, you know, we've got even a larger target on our back and that there are more programs being put in place to prevent us from ever getting out of the condition that we're in. Because, right. you know, one of the big deals is, you know, you you get a good education and you can pull yourself out of the situation, the economic situation, the social situation that you might find yourself in right. as a family. And, and that family history could be halted. Right. However, if you get into an altercation, you might not have had that bad family history, but you're about to start it. Right, yeah, and I think, you know, this to me is something that should bring us closer together even more because it's really important to just, like I said, find alternative, um, alternatives to <laughs> physical altercations. Not that we do that on a regular basis, but just the fact that the consequences are so great, it doesn't matter, you know. Oh, you're only a kid. According to this, that doesn't matter. Five years old? And, and if, if the judicial system was run by a computer that took in information, so if it was just a matter of just taking in the information and then determine it based on the value of these different bits of information, like how strong of a family background, mm-hmm. you know, what, what, what else has this child ever done? If you could create a, a, a system like that, then maybe, not for, not for kids, I still don't think that this is something that we should do incarcerating our children, but then maybe we could say the judicial system is fair and balanced. But we know that it's not. Right. We know that when you go, when, when little Johnny, who's, you know, who lives in the, in the upper class neighborhood, he's a white, you know, upper class neighborhood, young uh, white male, age seven, he beats up somebody else in school. Well, little Johnny's going to get a, a, a different kind of uh, adjudication. As a matter of fact, he probably won't even get put there. They'll probably just say, you know what, it's time for y'all to take mm-hmm. Johnny and send him to your aunt's house for a couple of years just so right. we don't have to, you know, get all in trouble for not, you know, putting him in jail for the next seven years. Right. And we see that. You saw that with the rape case, the, the guy who rapes the woman, and because mm-hmm. he's a Stanford or, or whatever school he went through, went to, he was now given different treatment than somebody else who did the exact same thing somewhere else. Mm-hmm. You know, it's um, this is again, again, an opportunity for them to, them being the system. The system can now do more to limit and prevent uh, the chances of of people of color or people in general, mm-hmm. you know, from ever getting their lives on track and in order, even before they even understand what a prison is, mm-hmm. right. before they even understand what incarceration is, what it, before they understand what it's like to not be around your mama for the rest of well seven years. Right. They're about to put you into a confined situation. And, and I would suspect you would be with other little criminal children. Mm. It sounds so Not bad. the children of criminals. Yeah. I, I, can't, I don't even want to say that. But, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Yeah, it's, it's extremely bad. It's and, pretty bad. You know, we, we do have a guest here today. We I, do. I want to make sure today? that we bring her in on this conversation. And yes, and she has, she has a lot to do with children, too. So go ahead, introduce our guest. Sure, Who are we? We have Persona Ghost. Did I say it right? Ghost, uh huh. Ghost, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> um, she is from the One Love is True Change movement. Is it a movement? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, please chime in on this topic if you can. Sure. Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, everything you guys are saying is on point. I think that we're, we're, we're looking at a, at a punitive stance, mm-hmm. you know, on, on our kids, right? Mm-hmm. But then, for me, my focus is what are we putting into the kids? Oh, um, what are we putting into our youth, you know? So, um, you know, when, when things happen, of course, we, we deal with it, you know, as a, me, of course, personally, I, I'm in the homeschool community, so mm-hmm. we deal with it as a village, mm-hmm. you know, and... Um, figure out what's going to help the child grow, you know, but in the meantime, what are we putting into the youth, right? Right. So, um, so some of my research, some of my work that I've been doing in the community as far as with education is just reassessing how we even look at education, mm-hmm. schools, period, right? What are, we, what are we teaching our kids, right? Right. So a lot, uh, if you look at the Common Core standards and all of this, we're, we're sort of cycling all of these these skills just these um non-stop skills for for year after year right so if it's math you're going from from time to measurement to to algebra to to division you know all all of these these sort of standards are just being thrown at thrown at students and what happens after a few years you know you get tired of it you know it might have been interesting maybe at one point or a couple points and then there's there's no sense to it there's no context to it you know so um so then the disinterest starts to happen 
right? And then uh, when you look at all the different subjects that we're even teaching at schools, right? So mm -hmm. you look at English, you look at math, you look at science. These are all languages, right? And um, and if they're languages, to me, w what hit me is that the the primary language of living as a human being, as a as a being on this earth, to me is love, mm -hmm. and we're not teaching that. Right. You know, we're not teaching the language of love. We don't just say. We don't just say, I love you. That's an act. What does that look like? What does it mean to love your neighbor? What does that mean to love yourself? What does that mean to love your family, right? right. So these these are things that I would rather be, you know, investing in rather than this punitive end. Right. right. Yeah, well, we happen to be in the United States of America where yeah. you, we were talking uh, just a minute ago. What's that, the movie, The 13th Amendment? Yeah. Or 13th? Yeah. Yeah, that um, we're, we're, we incarcerate more people per capita than any other country on the planet and that's crazy and there's some places that don't even have prisons that's crazy like you know what has what has happened in the united states of america except that somebody's figured out wow this is a great opportunity to prevent population growth in areas that we don't want it because all you have to do is find somebody you know with a hangnail and say all right it's time for us to lock them up because they got two hangnails and um in addition to that, undereducate, you know, undernourish with regard when we start talking about health and wellness. So you undernourish a population of people, and an undernourished child is likely to be more rambunctious and 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 less academically prepared in school and, and you know to learn or to engage in that process. Mm -hmm. So you you're literally setting up a whole population mm -hmm. of people, right. you know, to be a part of a system that looks like on the outside it looks like it's just about some money. But my contention is, yeah, that's what it appears on the surface. But actually, when you look a couple layers deeper, you realize that it's not just about money. It's about population control. Right. You know, we see what uh, your, your, your president, because it's not my president, but, you know, <laughs> your president has done now. He's now controlling population. He's now locking the borders of the United States of America and saying, you know what, that we're going to control this. We're not going to let y'all folks in here. And at some point, that translates into you know what, I don't even want to bring a child into this world mm -hmm. of all this craziness. Right. So whereas 50, 60 years ago, we saw children as a, a blessing. We saw children as, you know, a, as a as value. You know, right. we valued children. And, and it was a reward and a blessing to be able to have a child and bring forth life and to raise a child. Now it's a curse. Now it's a burden. Now it's, oh, my God, I don't want to have a son because if I get a, have a son, and he's likely to get shot, and you know he's likely to be in this prison to, I mean, school to prison pipeline, and you know you go down the list of all these things, and there's so many negatives. You just find yourself saying, you know what, you know, maybe I just won't do anything. Right. I just back out. Well, I won't do anything. And all you become then is like cannon fodder. You're just you're just working for the system in the sense that you're working to um, to uh, perpetuate the goals and aims and, and objectives of the system. What say you, Prashona? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's what it is, you know. So I mean, so I think, I think for for me, you know, it's it's. I'm I'm a big believer in in you know you create the change you want to see, right? And I know you are too. That's where we are, right? Yeah. So um, so for me, I think it's it's just sitting there and figuring figuring out what it is, what world do we want to create for us for our children to live in, mm -hmm. you know, and then we and then we you know, pick up a tool and start chiseling. You know, and we see folks with like minds and we, we, we come together and we work together and we build we build this vision, you know. Right, yeah. right. Tell us about you. Who are you? Where are you from? And what puts you on this path? Because it's not, you know, it's not oftentimes you see somebody who's not necessarily of the, of either the, we'll say the Spanish-speaking Latino or South of South American population, Central and South American population, or somebody who's African or African-American who um, who's challenged by these circumstances, but on top of that, who wants to do something about it. So tell us about yourself and, and why you got into this. Sure. So, um, let's see, why did I take this back? So I'm um, Bengali-American. Uh, I was born in Calcutta, Kolkata in West Bengal, India, and we moved to the States when I was four years old, 1987. And um, I grew up in Baltimore and moved to the Bay Area, California, um, San Jose, Santa Clara, Eastside, uh, East Oakland. And um, 
and spend some time. You know, I had the opportunity to go to El Salvador and the border of Mexico. You know, spent time over there and then, you know, came back over here. Uh, I've been working at a for uh, at a correctional facility um, called what used to be called Oak Hill Detention Facility. It was renamed to New Beginnings. I worked at the school there, Maya Angelou Academy, and uh, since then been getting into case management and, you know, working as a teacher in different African-centered programs and, um, you know, and then starting the One Love Movement, you know, with, with different friends in the community from the East Coast and the West Coast. So that's sort of a, my path in a nutshell, I guess. Right, right. Well, t- tell us about the movement for those of us who aren't familiar with it. Sure. So, um, so I guess through my journey, I have, I've been seeing um, discrepancies, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, where I grew up in Baltimore, it was uh, a poor neighborhood. It was predominantly white. And uh, so, you know, we knew, we knew what it was to be a have-not, mm-hmm. right? right? But um, but I didn't necessarily see in color right. fully until I moved out to California. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there it was like I saw neighborhoods that was just like mine, you know, just like the one that we grew up in, mm-hmm. but, um, but in color, you know, uh, in black and brown, Asian, you know, and I started to see, see the differences, right? You know, of course, we had the, the low income in common. We had certain, you know, crimes and, you know, drugs and things in common. But, um, you know, I would say the, the, the major difference, well, two major differences. One, of course, with having all that culture, right. you know, in there, there's a lot of love, you know, and a lot of, under, you know, mutual understanding, right. you know, of one another, even, you know, across cultures. And I love that about the Bay. And, um, and the negative side was, was murder. You know, it was homicide. You know, that was the major difference. You know, I had a friend of mine, Dale, that I went to school with in um, Santa Clara for undergrad. And, he, you know, we were exchanging stories of growing up. And he was like, Sean, I know you from the hood. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like, man, we never called it that. Right. You know, I was like, I mean, it was poor white folks. You know what I mean? It was right. like Section 8 neighborhood, you know, but we never called it the hood, you know. Right. He was like, really? You know, so I ended up, you know, I went to his neighborhood in um, East Oakland, Sabrina Park. And, um that area and that it was it was yeah I saw, I saw it it was like oh, okay you know I had, I had a friend named Summer and she she we, you know we worked at a youth center together in East Oakland and she said she was sobbing one time in this meeting that we had and she said you know I'm I'm I I I can't even like you know I'm I'm past my fingers mm-hmm. on like the number of friends that I've lost growing up here right. you know and I'm I'm sick of it you know I'm tired of it and it and it hit me that this is it's a war zone, yeah. Yeah. you know. It's 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 a straight war zone, and I and it's something that I didn't even know about, mm-hmm. you know, from me growing up in the states. You know, like I thought that was the worst. <laughs> you know, I thought our neighborhood right. was like the worst it came. You know, and then all of a sudden you you see a melanin, right. and it's like people being set up to die. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so so yeah, I think that that fed my passion mm-hmm. a lot, and just you know, um, just my life became to to spread the knowledge that that I've gained mm-hmm. you know throughout my life from my experiences and spread it to the people that it should be number one primarily going to you know right. young people of color right. so that's that's how you know that's how my my my, la- my like life in the last like 15 20 years came about and then um one love happened i was working at the correctional facility and uh, a friend of mine, Tay, Shante Williams, uh, we were teaching a class. It used to be called American History X, where we teach these aspects of history that we felt were not being taught. Mm-hmm. You know, and, um, and then it became the cipher. You know, we called it the cipher because, you know, we realized knowledge is 360 degrees, right? Everybody has something to teach and everybody has something to learn, you know. And um, my friend Tay said, she said, Pashona, you know, we're taking for granted that people out there, that's what we call, you know, folks outside of the jail, you know, like, out there, you know, taking, you know, taking for granted that people out there know this information. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, what do you suggest? She was like, I suggest we have a gathering, mm-hmm. you know, like a bi-monthly gathering. We work, especially with people that work with youth, you know, in the community, and we spread the knowledge, you know, mm-hmm. that, that we're spreading to them. So I was like, all right, well, what do we call it? She's like, something everybody understands. Call it One Love, right. you know. And, you know, I started from there, started my mom's house, um, stuff that we were teaching, you know, our boys, you know, our young men at the correctional facility. Mm-hmm. And um, spreading it out, and uh, and then that eventually became 
uh, you know, a community event over at um, Sweet Sweet it started at Sweet Natural Sweet and Natural mm-hmm. in Mount Rainier, and then to uh, Soul Fifty Seven with uh, Baba Mawale, and then here we were blessed to you know uh, do a couple of events here at Everlasting Life, and um, and it's just it's just been growing. We we uh, opened up a homeschool component mm-hmm. uh, two and a half years ago, mm-hmm. and our and our co-op you know, vendors and, and artists and healers of color in the area. Right. So, yeah, that's, right. that's where I am. <laughs> that, that is extremely interesting. I love the way you took your experience and your personal passion and turned it into something that's actually helping people because we talk a lot about action on this show, and I love the fact that you've taken action. Um, now, you mentioned homeschool. How does that play into it? Oh, man. I think um, the more I started getting into, you know, the what I call the knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, and um and you just realize how deep the rabbit hole goes right. you know I, the the big thing that hit me was is education mm-hmm. is what we're teaching our youth right? right so um and i was in a conversation with a circle of folks that were talking about well we need to have an after school program you know to undo you know some of the things that they're doing in the schools like well forget the after school program what about starting our own school right. you know so that we don't have to undo <laughs> so much you know right. and um and as I started forming these ideas of, you know, of of how how to start, you know, aligning things. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I taught at one school, we had like it seemed like fifty different books on, you know, for one subject. We had a language arts book, we had a spelling book, we had a, you know, a, a vocab book, we had a reading book, we had a long term reading book. It was it was insane, you know. Right. And then you barely had time to to teach the science or the social studies, you right. know. And um, and then the math standards were off, you know, off the charts. You know, it was a, so you know, just that it started becoming my project on how can we frame the curriculum mm-hmm. that we teach the youth so that it actually does resonate with their experience. Hope you know that's the objective. That's the that's the hope. Um, you know, and and help them form a consciousness of themselves, of of the community, and you know, and their their role, their responsibility to it. You know, so that's that's how. The homeschool came about, so that's been my my baby for right, last right. well, no, I, I mean, I absolutely love that, and just the fact that you have a, a whole curriculum—that's not something that's easy to do. Yeah. You know, so you have a, a support team that you work with. Sure. Yeah. I'm the the parents uh, of of my homeschool community. I've been blessed. Mm-hmm. I've been blessed. Um, it was, you know, I've been reading The Alchemist. You know, that's what we're reading right now this this semester, and I'm so big on it. Uh-huh. You know, I, I tell my scholars it's like a like a manual for, for, for living and following your dreams, right? right? So, um, you know, and they say this thing in The Alchemist that, you know, when you decide, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, when you decide what you want to do, mm-hmm. you know, then the universe sort of makes a way, right. you know? So you just have to decide, right. you know? And it's been amazing that I, I tell folks, it's right now this is probably the least income that I've made in my life, you know, and and yet the most rent I paid in my life because we took over the lease to have the homeschool there, right. and um and yet somehow <laughs> right. bills are getting paid, right. blessfully, and you know and and I'm allowed to create this curriculum and I'm I'm being supported by wonderful parents, you know, and you know I'm just I'm I'm blessed, you know we're blessed, you know. Right, right. Well, what are um. Give us the well, one of the greatest untold stories. You mentioned, um, you know, teaching as part of the curriculum. Some, you know, some stories that may not be included in what the children, in, you know, regular school are learning. Is there one that stands out that maybe we should do some research on? Or? Oh man, there's so many. <laughs> it's so many. Okay, I, I tell you this. Um, so, it, so in my research, just realizing I'm really big on the story. Mm-hmm. You know what's the journey? What's the story? Right. So um, I'm I'm really super not big on the way that we just throw material. Like right. you know, like it's like let's you take science. Okay, now we're gonna learn chemistry. Now we're gonna learn about atoms. Now we're gonna learn you know about biology, and it's just thrown, right? right? You know, right. just like the math standards are thrown, the English standards, and it's it's like wh- what's the what's the form? What's the journey? Right. You know, so in looking at the journey of let's say science. Um, I, I started looking at space, right? Because that's really where it all sort of happens, right? Mm-hmm. So when you so when you start in space, you know, you start with dark matter, dark energy, right? What's called dark matter, dark energy. Then you look at stars, right? Mm-hmm. The formation of stars. Because really that's where all matter 
derives from right. you know stars so um and then and then from looking at stars and then then looking into the planets then looking into the evolution mm -hmm. of life on this planet you right. know and um and then while while I'm doing that um I like to present the the metaphors that you can take from them as well as the science because I think a lot of times we separate right? right so there's science here there's art here there's English here but what if we can get the scientific base right, right. and you know and, and well researched scientific base you know right. and also see what, what what's the possible poetry behind this you know so that's that's been my biggest sort of uh, uncovering I guess in this process of, of writing curriculum is is that um, even English you know same thing mm -hmm. so well actually th so what I do with the English is it it follows that science social studies Format. So you're getting the science, you're getting the social studies, but you're getting through the English. You know, we're, we're building our vocabulary, we're building our grammar as we're learning about the world and ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how many students and, and parents do you have working with you? Sure. So, um, so this year we have five students in our cooperative. I try to cap it between five to eight. Mm -hmm. so I, it's, it's me teaching. Right. So I like to keep it small. So we do home visits, you know, we, you know, uh, it's, it's more conducive to a small learning, you know, a small learning environment. Right. Um, and now I'm actually, I actually opened up this semester to some one-on-one um, -on -one and two-on-one -on -one tutoring. So we're actually, we're, we're doing that also. So we're expanding to the five to 10. So right. the idea is to spread the model, you right. know, so for other teachers that are interested in, you have your five to 10, right. you know, and then, and we keep, keep the vision small. And then as we focus on our, our youth, you know, instead of focus on, 200 300 a thousand youth you know you focus on your family your tribe right you know and then we come together and exchange right. you know yeah I, I absolutely love that concept <laughs> thank you yeah that is great and and we were just talking about the uh the issues that we're seeing in the school system now some one of the issues there are many issues from from what's being taught to what they're eating to now this school to prison pipeline right you know why do you think that this type of schooling is maybe better for you know our students as compared to what's being offered out there if I didn't already make it make sense with what I asked you yeah <laughs> man because because I feel like in when when you have this this opportunity this homeschool opportunity the the world is literally your oyster it's it's what you want to impart on the youth you know so the the parents and I are in constant conversation you know, uh, they know the themes that I'm covering. They they tell me themes that they want to cover, and we build it. You right. know, um, so I mean that in itself is something that you just right. don't. You know, in in schools they have the same curriculum. Even if you look at science curriculum, they're teaching the same science curriculum that they taught for the last 40, 50 years. Do you know how many discoveries and <laughs> research has you know there's been since then? Right. You know, like just looking up planets, right. like what we found out about exoplanets. You know, right. there 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 there's a planet out there that's made out of straight diamond. Mm straight diamond you know what i mean it's, it's just some incredible things out here in the universe that right. that we're not you know we're not exposing our youth to right. you know and we're just assuming okay they're getting educated they're you know send them off to the nine to three you know but here it's like mm -hmm. you, you know you get to explore the universe with yeah. you know with your with your scholars and you know right now we're working on a lyrical analysis project as well because I, I i'm about done with the trap music, I'm about done. Yes. I have I have my my babies, three of my babies are huge trap music, you know, uh -huh. fans, and I'm, you know, I you know I just sit there like, like can y'all can we can we let's let's analyze what it is that we're listening to, you know, and so we sat there and we we, you know, analyzed it line for line the themes, mm -hmm. you know, so at the end it's like, okay, so this is what we're meditating on, because essentially when you're you know when you're on music like this and it's in your headphones and you're constantly, you know repeating the verses all day long you know this is your meditation you know so and then we you know looking at the politics of it you know looking at the prison industrial complex and its connections with the prison you know, with the music industry right. right which is inextricably connected right and then um so now we're we're actually exploring the decades so like starting from the 60s to the 70s looking at music analyzing the music from the different decades and you know it's their connection to what was going on politically at the time you know right. so this is stuff that i've never i've never had the opportunity to do right. in a public school setting you know right so, and I, 
So were you were you analyzing this with the three year olds? I was just curious. Oh, well, so this year we're at middle school, so about fifth to eighth grade. Okay, so mm -hmm. you were talking it over with the fifth to eighth grade. So, yes. Okay, I was gonna say because what what were some of the responses <laughs> of the three year olds? Mother, oh yeah, yeah, no, we have, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite with the three year olds. Okay, good, good. Go ahead, Chris. Um, what well, I was gonna say that um, what you're doing is really important, and I think. You mentioned one thing that I think is extremely important in that when you have that smaller setting um, and everybody kind of is responsible for their own little one and then you come together as a village. Right. I think that's really important because I think what we've done as a society, we've gotten too big. And that's in every aspect. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, you know, mass produce this and mass this and mass that. Then we lose the specific details that I think are very important, especially when it comes to raising and teaching a child. Right. You know, because you can't streamline it because each individual is so unique. Right. That's how people get lost. And I know there's, you know, the Montessori, you know, type thing where you kind of let kids figure it out. And there are other teaching styles. But I think it all comes down to really giving each child as much individual or concentrated yeah. attention as possible. Right. Right. You know, and learning how to work together with others so that, you know, each one's individual and unique gift can shine together. Exactly. You know, it's like when we come together, my reference is always the um, the X-Men. You know, everybody has their superpower. You come right. together and it's this huge, you know, amazing thing. I think if we can get back to that, if we can have more of what you're doing, you'd be in a much better position. Exactly. You know, it you know, just imagine, you know, a, a classroom of 30 students, right? There's no way that you can form a, a you know, a meaningful relationship. I mean, you know, it, there's, there's things, you know, you might pick up, I like, I like about this teacher or whatever, but, you know, building a relationship is serious work. Yeah. It's serious work, you know, whether that's with, you know, uh, your family, your friends, your neighbors, whatever it is. So, you know, for me, that's, that's been a big lesson for me in the homeschool environment is is building a relationship with my scholars, with their parents, mm -hmm. you know, doing these home visits where I go to their home and, you know, they allow me, they bless me to come into their home and, right. you know, work with them and, you know, so they can see that I'm, I'm with you, I'm a partner, right. you know, in this and, you know, not some other, you know, that you have to fight against, you know. Right. So when you open up the little kids section, because, you know, I know a couple <laughs> kids. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're hearing this right now and, you know, you're, and, and, you know, the, the two to three or the two to five pop, you know, uh, uh, age group is your thing, you right. know, call in. Right. You know? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think that's been a process, too, of figuring out what 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 is your groove, right. you know, in it. Because you yeah. always want it to center around what you're what and who you're passionate Absolutely. is about right otherwise they're gonna feel it right? right so i'm realized i realized for me i still have yet to figure out how to work with younger right. you know younger age groups because it requires a, a yeah. you know yeah. it requires a universe it's of patience right for sure yes. for sure that you know that um i i'm humbled <laughs> i'm humbled by and still have yet to 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 learn you know i think uh realizing that for me i think third grade yeah you know and uh into the into the higher years where i can yeah. get down and you know talk talk right. to you about some you know lyrics real, and you know you, you know but i mean there are ways to do it from a younger age oh, yeah. you just have to have more patience with it and that's it's a it's a sacred task you know right. absolutely absolutely so important yeah mm -hmm. it's something that we definitely can't take for granted because i think you know we get so caught up in the hustle and bustle you know trying to make money trying to make sure the bills are paid trying to you know make ends meet that we forget the importance of it sure. because for me, I had to stop thinking about my kids as my babies, and I had to think, I'm raising little adults. Mm, you know, I have to raise right. them to be functional um, when they become of age and they, they're on their own because me babying them is not going to help them at point. all. That's a great point. That's a great point. You know, yeah. so it's, it's just so important. Yeah, yeah and I, I've had four, and I know what that's like. <laughs> yeah. and, and I've had an opportunity to experiment and see what works and what doesn't work, and, you know, I think... We figured it out and uh, we got some really good results. Mm -hmm. But uh, we tried different schools. We tried the African Center for many years. Mm -hmm. We tried uh, Montessori, you know, because we were looking for something that was going to be a better fit for them so that they would embrace knowledge and they would learn and, and it could carry them forward. Not just, like you said, some of the stuff that's been, that's been taught for the last 50 years that, you know, uh, I, I guess there's value in it, but uh, I still haven't figured out what Miss you know, so-and-so taught me in that one class right. that has no relevancy to anything, right. but I had to take it, right? right. So, and, and it's, uh, I, I, I've learned about what 
um, J.D. Rockefeller has done to the educational system. And Roshana, I'm sure you've probably heard of or seen the video, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. Have mm -hmm. you heard of that? I've seen some clips. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's pretty awesome to think that somebody has set out to keep people from being intelligent and therefore allowing you the controlling hand to manipulate them and move them in whatever direction you want them to and get no resistance. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty It's pretty sad. And, but, you know, mm -hmm. and I say this thing, you know, if you look at it from a, from a sociological standpoint too, right, it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So the U.S. is, is the, one of the largest military nations in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it would behoove, you know, the government to not have thinking civilians, right? You know, if you're if you're constantly conscientious of what's going on, then you might not want to be a part of that system anymore, you know? But um so you know, it 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 behooves the system to want to have robots as factory line sort of concept of of education where the the point isn't to question further. You know, the point is to to be able to to take it and and regurgitate it, you know? And that's why we look at this uh, this new presidential person in the uh, in the leadership position over the United States of America, and you know you, you see two sides of that. Because on the one hand, you see that somebody has jumped in the game now who doesn't fit the mold and who's going to shake things up. But on the other side of that, you're realizing you're realizing or we're realizing that shaking it up isn't necessarily what everybody or shaking it up in all areas is not what we necessarily need. But we are seeing how this individual is jumping out there and making a bunch of ripples and, uh, you know, not always something that we like, but definitely not continuing us on the path that we've been on, right. which, which I think for, for us in our seats, we now know that, okay, so you can disrupt the apple cart. You don't have to go, you know, and do what everybody else is doing. Right. You don't have to be a mindless worker. You can actually, you know, think and do things differently from what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's one of the most important things. I mean, like you said, we have a lot of complaints about what's going on, but really it's put put us our, um, us in a position to examine ourselves, you know, like you just said, you know, and just to not be a part of the, you know, bandwagon. You can do your own thing and, and do it better because we've been brainwashed. You know, we're robots. We don't know how to go out and farm. We don't know how to sew any clothes. We don't know how to build a house, you know. The government collapses, we're, you know, most of us are done, you know, so I think this is a time where it, it gives us a second chance. You know, I, I'm very interested to see how this election goes four years from now, you know, have, are people really going to wake up and stay awake mm -hmm. this entire time? Are we awake the first year, you know, and then we're going to fall asleep in year two and then we go back to the normal, oh, well, this is just the way it is. Right. You know, what's really going to be the outcome of that? But I, I do say we should really take, take um, advantage of this opportunity that we've been given. Mm -hmm. I say having a having a president like you know like we have now it definitely keeps you on your toes right because right. right. you're constantly looking to see what's what's he up to now what's exactly. he doing now exactly. you know probably far more than than I know I've done yeah definitely. you know in in the past with previous presidents definitely. right because there's that that sort of complacency like all right no yeah. most part you probably gonna do some all right you know kind of right. stuff even if you know and and really to be to be real with the um, with our last presidency is as as much grace as you know as they've offered they've also you know and and support in you know in ways to the to the community they've also done things that are you know that weren't the most beneficial that you know that that were de that were detrimental or at least neglectful right. you know of um of of different communities and i think that it's it's fair to have a fair assessment of each president, right. you know? So I think that's something that this, this presidency is teaching me is, is to constantly stay vigilant. Definitely, definitely. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, people want to get in contact with you because they want you to raise their kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But, I mean, there are people who have a like mind. They, they think like you think. They want to be involved with people who think like they think and who are making moves like the moves that you're making. Our children, indeed, are one of our biggest investments that we tend to spend the, most, the least amount of our resources on, unfortunately. Right. And, uh, you know, so tell, tell our audience how we would get in contact with you. Sure, sure. So you can... Um uh, you can check out the website, you know, to get a whole full gambit. It's uh, onelovestruechange.com. It's all spelled out. Mm -hmm. You can email me, the people son, like the sun in the sky at gmail.com. You can also text me, 240-447-2983. And whatever questions, reflections, anything that you have, I appreciate it. And, you know, you're welcome.
right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm definitely going to go and check out the website and be prepared, you know, in 10 years or so when my kids are <laughs> <Appreciate it. laughs> um, But uh, for those of you in the community, we do have some special events coming up. Uh, tomorrow's Wednesday, and so that means we have the Health, Wealth, and Knowledge of Self workshop series. Um, we have a topic. Have a topic? Not yet? Uh, yeah, I think we're going to kind of do a continuation on what we were talking about last week, okay. which was uh, a little bit about health and a little bit about wealth yep. and positioning ourselves so that we can and engage in both of those and move ourselves forward. But uh, I think more specifically, we're seeing that we're, we're needing to do more work with uh, women's health. Yes. Not necessarily because women are unhealthier, but th there's some specific things that we can do to help support women be healthy and that's what we'll be doing this wednesday right getting beyond the taboo right yeah all right it. also um we have the friday night the dinner and a movie which i'm particularly excited about um we're going to be showing some independent films so you can make it a family night make it a date night come out and hang out grab a bite to eat and join us for a movie that's every friday starting this month from 7 to 9 p.m join us for that um, we also have the Solstice Bazaar, which is up and running again this Saturday, February 4th. That's going to be 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can come out and get your shop on, support the community, support our black businesses. They have some phenomenal vendors. I've been here every time, and it's been wonderful and different every time, so I encourage you to come out for that. We also have the Fitness Challenge, which is very important because that brings us into our holistic health. Not only can you come down and get, get a great bite to eat you can um, get your fitness on and work with the team there and just you know keep your health going get out and run get some fresh air what else does she have you doing push-ups jumping jacks how's it go yeah, I, I, get, uh, I get on my fair share of push-ups and jumping jacks and squats and by the time she's finished with me i'm pretty much um i don't know whether fit is what i feel but I feel maybe something like that okay well maybe two or three days after you feel a little fit um, and I think that's it for now. So, guys, I thank you again for joining us. Um, if you're not able to join us for those events, that's okay, because we're going to be back on the air tomorrow with another great show. This has been the Eat Like Power Lunch. We'll see you next time, guys. Take care.